All right, so before we continue on the Teddy Gumiushi conversation, I do want to bring Jack up because he kindly came by to join us here. Jack I'll step out so you guys can chat with him. Applause for Jack Etienne. So we're not going to answer, ask any questions about rumors that rumors, might be going on with the current roster, but we can talk about your kind of really surprising end to the summer in LCS. Like, I, I don't think anybody really had, had you pegged as Do we have as to talk winning. about that again? Great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How'd that go? I don't remember. I've forgotten, forgotten already. I've forgotten already. So can you, can you like, walk us through? Because, like, bringing Jensen back was, was obviously, like, for, you know, you started the year with a plan in place that ended up getting upended. You then had to kind of triage the roster. You brought Jensen back in, who wasn't... He, he had to get back into form, I would say that. So what was the process of your summer season, and how did you manage to peak so high at the end? I, I don't even know where to start about all the moves that we made between <laughs> spring and summer. You made so much I moves. don't think it needs like to we, be... We, we, you don't we, need we, to be chronological, but no, like, what's the big piece? Moving Fudge from mid to top, yeah. get his what one change. It's kind of big, right? Moving our, our, our benched AD carry to support, okay, that's pretty crazy. Bringing in a mid laner who hasn't played for an entire split, okay, that's pretty wild as well. Starting completely rebooting, like, well, I guess at that point wasn't rebooting the coaching staff, but we did have a very young coaching staff. So, and to top it all off, two of our players lose their passports uh, before <laughs> the split starts. So our, our planned boot camp in Korea was completely thrown off. Uh, Fudge gets COVID. And, and he gets stuck in Korea because of it. He's like stuck in a hotel room. And so we don't actually get the players into the United States until week three of an eight week split. So we've got a pretty large like order to, to chop down to actually get our team ready for playoffs. And maybe even like, do we even qualify for playoffs? That's, that's like basically the goal. And our, our, I remember thinking with the team, we're thinking, we just need, like, it's going to be hard. We know it's going to be really hard. We just need to be somewhere near, like, our peak as the end of the regular season happens. If we can just squeeze in the playoffs as the eighth-seeded team, that's great, and we'll just fight our way all the way up. That was kind of our plan. Um, and we didn't expect to actually win the entire split, but we were thinking, hey, I think we can get, like, top three and show up to Worlds. What, was there a, a moment during the split where you're like, Okay, we're gonna be fine. A moment, a play, a match that you guys won, a scrim where you 3 0'd or you know, it, made someone rage quit. It felt like around week seven that our scrims were really starting to come together, that the communication between the players was actually functioning, um, that our bot lane knew what they were supposed to do. And so going into like that last week of regular season, we were the confidence was like, hey, I, I actually think like we're gonna get to worlds. It wasn't thinking we're gonna win this thing, but it was definitely thinking we're gonna we're gonna get to worlds. And you guys won, you know, with the strength, especially of the meta and Berserker's performance. And then we saw this really, like, huge meta shift, as well as like, a, a lot of, I think, difficulty for teams to prepare for Worlds. And I, and, and I know, Papa, you can, you can talk to this as well. But because the weird thing is because Worlds is an NA and all the Asian teams and European teams just waited until, like, the last possible second and scrimmed in their own region. Was it harder for you guys than normal to prepare for the for the tournament? I mean, for sure, the traditional boot camp, whether it's Korea, if it's in if the world's in Korea or an adjacent region or Europe, um, allows you to have you know a team bonding event. You get out there, you get to scrim against new teams that are all in form. In NA, it was just us scrimming among us ourselves for the first week or so, and then uh, you know just coming out of off season mode, so pretty low quality scrims, and then our only other option was to scrim kind of like. 80-ish ping to Mexico when the planes that didn't, that showed didn't up. Work out. That didn't it didn't work, work out. We, no. we tried. We I, tried. Think it, I think it even spiked from 80 ping to like 100 it, the second it, or third it was, day. It was not really functional. Um, so we ended up just kind of taking turns. Like one team didn't play. So it'd be like Cloud9 versus 100 one day, and then 100 versus like, you know, EG for yep. a day. And we just like rotated that way. Did the best with what we could with what we had. Because the alternative was in like a 10-day period to double jet lag yourself like 14 hour time zones to Korea or something like that and after a really long season and punishing year I don't think it was real for any team I think all teams kind of reached out like quietly and were like what are you guys going to do and, and no one was like we're going to take this on it's the right move for us so the, the scheduling this year was very different than what we've seen for the last literally the last like nine years where we could actually have like a month in Korea to boot camp that wasn't the case we had like right. a week so this wasn't real how would you, I mean, you know, Jack, especially you, you've, Cloud9 has made it 
further at Worlds than any other North American team. So where do you, how do you evaluate for your performance this year versus previous years where you're, you're known for getting out of groups? Or how do you evaluate the LCS as a whole? Because I think a, a lot of fans were like pretty disappointed by the LCS performance, especially because the tournament was, was in North America. I, I think like, of course, we're not happy about it. And of course, we're really disappointed and want to get further. But I think if you did take a step back and you realize our roster literally had like five weeks to play together, <laughs> Fair. Before Worlds, um, I think we did pretty damn good. And in my like my exit interviews, and that just means like the end of the year interviews with my players. Um, I was like, when I was sitting down with Berserker, he was like, you know, of course I was disappointed not getting further, but I I'm really proud of what we did in summer. I'm really proud of how we came together, and I wonder what we'll look like after an entire year um, of playing together. And so, um, you know, and I can kind of leak this. Like, he told me, like, I'm like, would you want to play with Core JJ? Would you want to play with any of these other supports that are coming up? And he said, no, I love Sven. I want, I want to see what Sven can become. I trust him. He's growing so fast. Let's, let's run it back again. That, that was actually one of my questions, just because we haven't seen in many AD carries make that kind of a move, Core JJ being one of them. It, but just so dramatically, very, with so much pressure on him to do it, what, what was the growth point for Sven to be like, all right, this is the guy that we're going to build it upon. We're not going to take another support in North America. We're not going to import uh, this role. We want to roll the dice with Sven at that role. Uh, are you talking about before summer? or Yeah, so it, it was really something um, that I just kind of like, I infected my players' minds with in spring, to be honest, because I wasn't, I wasn't liking the direction we were going with our, with our support then. Um, and I started asking the coaches, hey, do you think Sven could do this? Because the guy works incredibly hard. His knowledge yep. of the bot lane is unparalleled, like at least in North America. Um, and so I thought this guy could do it if he puts in the work. Um, and you know, some of the guys look at me like, you're, you're crazy, dude. What are you, what are you talking about? But um, the more they talked about it, the more they thought about who, who Sven is as a person, they started thinking, maybe we could actually pull this off. Um, so somehow uh, I got them to believe me, and we tried it, and it worked out. I think he's someone that you can project the support role, and oh, once yeah. once he got on top of the the matchups and understand the role, I think there was a lot of confidence, at least on my side, that he would get there. Just knowing him, because outside of the org, he's still known for knowledge of matchups, what to play yeah. where. The moment that he can pilot his champion the way he needs to, he was always going to have a huge value add. Like he was going to splash value as a player before the, the actual performance got there. So. No guarantee it would have got there by the end of the split. You already talked about the timelines there, and you guys got very unlucky with no boot camp, right? Because people are in different countries. But credit to him, he's a, he's a top bloke, and it's good to yeah, see him. Yeah, perform. yeah, absolutely. Like he, there's something that Sven brings to a team. Like when you, he is by far the hardest working player on your team, and you, you know, anytime you're feeling a little lazy, you look over, you know, to the other desk and see this guy's grinding out, so looking super hard. You know, he, he gets everybody champion, else. Champion skew. Champion skew, of course. <laughs> Of course. And, um, and, and not only that, like in like the reviews, the guy is so incredibly knowledgeable. He's like having an extra coach. To, bo to be honest, like, he's probably one of the smartest coaches in the room when he's kind of acting in that role. He, he really adds a lot to that uh, other people may not be aware of. So as we, as we look forward to next year for LCS. Leaks, we... baby! Come on, Jack! <laughs> <laughs> I think there's been enough leaks this week, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you, you've been one of the more aggressive GMs about, you know, making, making changes. So what, what, without going into the, the leaks that may or may not be true, uh, what, what kind of shifts do you think are necessary with the team? Like, you look at this team and you're like, I need to make, you know, what, what adjustments or what, what, what is your thought process right now in constructing a roster? It, it's super tough to think about what changes I need to make when, again, we've only had, like, five weeks of right. regular season. So, like, I really am not in a place to say, hey, like, this didn't work yet. Because we haven't had put in the time to really find out. And this current iteration of the roster works incredibly well together. So, like... Um, I don't feel like I've, I've had enough time to sit there and say, oh, I know how what, it's, you know, what it takes to actually make this roster perform better on that time period. So it's going to be more along, like, what do the players feel comfortable about going with into next year and what's going to give them the most confidence, and that's how I'll make adjustments. And if you think about it, your, your team's performance has been judged on two patches, right? The playoffs patch is when you guys really ascend it to the next level. You know, the, the, the famous victory against EG in the first round to really... Was it TL or EG? I forget. EG? 
EG, EG, EG first, first round. round. That was like that a, was a tough surprise. one. That was that was tough for one. sure. Because that was when CLG no one. Was tough too. <laughs> yeah, well, and no one was looking at you guys, and then beating EG. Um, and then the world's patch, right? Like this, the two patches that the teams have been judged on. And I think it's another thing about like a Zeko, a DRX, where their entire development curve for a lot of people, not even just LCK newbies, but even people who watch them, is like, wow, on this world's patch, they've gone from zero to hero fast. And it's then suddenly like, okay, it's off season now. What are you doing next year? And there's so many questions and what ifs. Obviously, it was the what ifs for us at the end of 2021 when we couldn't get visa for either of our junglers and we had to go with underprepared to worlds, went three and three and beat EDG. And it was like, what does this mean for next year? I'm sure you have similar kind of limited infos where you have very strong hunches, some data, and then questions that you really can't know the answer to till week five of spring next year. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. We, there, I don't have enough information yet to really make any hard calls, and it's going to be more um, confidence feeling out of my players. You're famous for doing off-season boot camps. Do you have anything like that lined up already? So the last three boot camps we've had have failed, and so um, mainly because of things completely outside of our control. Sure, uh, yeah. like, Passwords being lost, COVID, and a, like a variety of other reasons. So we're we're being really cautious about what we do in this off season. Additionally, um, there's some scheduling changes. I, I'm not quite sure are public, so I'm not going to go into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't um, do that. So, um, <laughs> I, I, no, no, keep it, going. It, so we're still. <laughs> So we're so we're just taking we're taking our time trying to figure out what is going to be our approach to next split, um, and we're going to be like much more cautious of making sure that we don't end up in a situation where um, it, it is not productive like last year. As for the broader Cloud9 org, you guys got partnered in Valorant now. You know your uh, London Spitfire team and Overwatch League recently made a pretty good run into the playoffs. Um, what are you looking for as your goals next year as an entire org, especially with the new partnership system with Valorant, which I think sounds really good from my perspective. Are you happy with what Riot's doing with it? I'm absolutely thrilled with everything that's going on in Valorant. Um, I love like uh, our regions being the entire Americas, and that it looks like there's going to be more international events. And I'm really hoping that the learnings from what happens in Valorant's league gets pulled into league because they they've got some really good stuff. And I think it'll be really uh, good for the league ecosystem. I definitely think it's something I've been moaning about behind the scenes is the fact that. You know, there's this CB LOL is so popular and does really well, and this huge Portuguese audience. The LLA is, again, a smaller product, but that's a very passionate fan base there as well. The, I, the fact that we don't have that overlap, there isn't a Portuguese LCS stream or a pipeline between the regions is disappointing because you have Valorant as a counterpoint staring at you where you're like, really wish I could have that over here. Yeah, I mean, our, my Counter-Strike team right now is in Rio for the Major. And if you guys get a chance, like watch those streams. The fan base is absolutely insane in Brazil. And like, uh, your, your team's been giving me a heart attack when I've been watching. Uh, their I mean, games uh, why do you think I have gray hair? <laughs> <laughs> it is that team right there. Oh, um, I mean, the amount of times that you know, hey, it's thirteen four. It's not looking good, and my team somehow pulls it out. It's like their regular like modus operandi. And I really, uh, I think it's great for the fans, but it's not good for my heart. Yeah, I was watching the 15-6 comeback in the 0-2 match uh, against Imperial. That was... Um, yeah, oh my God. <laughs> I, it was uh, pretty, fun, pretty fun. It was a, yeah. it was a great game. It was yes. a great game. Yes. Uh, recently, uh, we had on Media Night, they announced that there's going to be format changes to Worlds. The single elimination will stay for the knockouts. So I won't ask specifically that, but if you had the opportunity to make a change to the Worlds format, what is something that you think isn't looked at that you would like to see in terms of... Uh, I guess, what would you like to see? What's a priority for you? Uh, I, I think, I think it's, it's nothing new. I really want to see like a double elimination format. Uh, I think it's, it adds a lot of excitement. Uh, I, I want to see, it's really sad that the four teams in each group, like that's the only exposure that these teams get to each other. And I yeah. want to see that be wide out. I love to see bigger groups or like when they have a TI where there, there's lots of overlap of the teams. I think one of the things I've been reflecting on is obviously we have three teams that went one and five. Everyone looks at the numbers, right? Because it's been this six game group stage for a long time. And it's like NA is getting worse is the conclusion you make because it's one instead of three, which was the previous kind of like norm. And it's been something I've been reflecting on. because obviously this world's format as four teams from the Asian regions becomes codified getting out of groups gets really difficult. Yeah. I think back to all the groups that C9 got out of in previous years where it was T1, C9, maybe a wildcard team, and like there was a bit more scope for it. But yeah. 
when you saw the 16 teams announced, you know, when it was the group draw show, you already knew <laughs> yeah. there were no good groups. Like, <laughs> you know, no all the groups yeah, are yeah, going to yeah. be they're all groups really, really <laughs> tough. And I think that's the moment where reinventing the format probably leads to more opportunities for parity than it does right now, where you, you lose the first two BO1s and you're kind of already condemned to uh, like an ulcer ran kind of yeah, show. I think, I think it's interesting you bring up the TI format, Jack, because uh, obviously I would prefer double elimination. I mean, I would prefer better groups and double elimination. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly. what I would prefer. I, I now, hold on. I hold on. That's, you, a, that's, that's asking too much. Uh, now, we know we're not going to get double elim. So I am hoping, like you're saying, that we get a more robust group format because as long as you had more games and groups, potentially with like bigger groups, then it does somewhat solve the problem of, of double elimination as, as well because you'd have more accurate seeding uh, for the Agreed. bracket. I, I would prefer the bigger groups over the double elimination if I had to choose one. If I had to choose one. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was, this is all theoretical. This and is as all soon theoretical. as you give me the bigger groups, I'm going to demand the double elimination. <laughs> <laughs> I want it all. Why choose one? I was going to say, I'm surprised you want the bigger groups because you're the NA team that, that usually makes the deepest runs at Worlds. So yeah. you would, I think, as far as LCS teams go, you would benefit historically the most from there being double elimination. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it, it's double-edged sword there, for sure. Um, obviously, we, w we won't count this team, this Worlds team, not, not because of results, just because it's recent, but what is your most memorable Worlds run um, here, now that we're here at the finals in person, but uh, like just Cloud9 because... run? Yeah. The I mean, most it has to be Cloud 2018, run. of course. I mean, getting to semis, like, beating a Korean team in a best of five is actually insane. Um, so that, without a doubt, was the, the most memorable, like, uh, run. And it was also interesting, like, because we were, all the teams were scrimming, uh, unknown team of, of Griffin and Damwon. And there was a challenger team, and the only team that was available. I figure it's a team where you just like, you know, we'll steamroll these guys, but, you know, it's good practice, right? And I find out, like, those guys as challengers weren't dropping a single team to any of the teams that were still in Worlds. I remember talking with the guys at Fnatic, you guys play these teams? Like, yeah, we got crushed. Us too, weird. And I, like, <laughs> it was, a, it was a definitely just an interesting year when we were all like, the best two teams are actually not playing in Worlds. <laughs> Happens. Happens. Us too. Weird. Do you want to do a clothing line collaboration? Sure. We'll do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, well, so, Jack, do you have any predictions for the, the match tonight that we're uh, going to see? I mean... What do you, so want, what do you want to I happen? I want DRX to 3-0. To, to like, okay. straight up. Like, <laughs> but the, I, I, I mean, look... 3-0. Yeah. Wow. Well... Well... What's well? Why, why do you why do you spell it out? Why do you say three zero? Is that just that's strong? The most unlikely result? Like, well, I I think the reason is is because I spend a lot of time scrimming against DRX with my players, and and so you build kind of a, a relationship with the team where they were one of our biggest scrim partners at Worlds, and so like I I want to see the guys that we're working with uh, go far, and I also just want to see T one fall down. So <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of heat between me and Joe, not going to lie. And, um, and they also knocked us out of world. So, yeah, uh, I want to see that happen. I, 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 can, I can appreciate that. I, I think for me, like, I think T1 will win. I hope it's not a 3-0, but I would absolutely love to see DRX win just for, for the narrative. It is, it's so incredible that they've gotten here so far that if they can pull off the, like, a, an actual legit win... It'll if, be very impressive. But I mean, if we've learned anything, whether it was you and I on the couch on Sunday or anybody watching DRX, the moment where you believe that they're out of it, where they've, you know, whether they're one down or they fall behind in a game, the moment that you count them out, they power up. You know, that, that, that's just an unbelievable phenomena where yeah. it's not intellectually honest of any analyst at any point to no. predict them to win, and yet they have <laughs> won from the round of 24 teams to top two. It's just the plot armor, man. It's it, the plot armor is insane. The anime storyline has to happen, armor. apparently. It's the mind control as well. I, again, let's see Faker get mind controlled by Zika. I want I mean, to Peanut see Peanut definitely got mind controlled, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Did, did we get like everybody's predictions on this? I, I, think, I think it's, it's going to be T1-3-0. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Said it so reluctantly. I, I don't want like my prediction. My heart hurts, but my brain says it's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm T one three one. Obviously, heart with DRX, but mm -hmm. I just they're, it, it, they're pretty similar teams, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think it will be a one sided series, one way or the other. 
Well, well yeah, th that's what I was going to say. It's either going to be 3-1 DRX or 3-0 T1. Like, I just, it depends be it, what DRX we get on the deck. I mean, I just think about how mentally resilient DRX has been through this Worlds, though. Yeah. I mean, they were they had to reverse sweep in their first yeah. series. Um, they got clapped by Gen G in game first one. First planes teams to make it to the final, so yeah. they were in Mexico as well. Yeah, yeah that, that, that is a buff. So, so I think about that. My opinion. Like, <laughs> it's also that DRX is just playing with absolutely no pressure. Like, they've yeah. already exceeded their own expectations, everybody's expectations, so they're kind of just free... To, you know, they're 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 not going to be seeing th feeling the same level of pressure as T1. I what think. I'm excited about is is there any dark tech? Because obviously scrims is going to be super super <laughs> minimal. I've heard some whispers of like Team McD style teams trying to step up some NA free agents and stuff trying to step up and be scrim partners for teams. But interesting in terms of like proper scrimmages, they would have had none for seven days and probably minimal the week before, and that means that. You know, it's people on 1v1s, you know, obviously you know that from Vega v 2 and getting in there. Like, there's going to be all sorts of, like, I know this team will pick this if it's open, what do you got moments. So is Silas going to be suspiciously left open for Zeka? Is, is Caitlyn going to be, yeah. gonna be left open for either team? Yeah. yeah. I think that's really scary for both teams. Yes. Um, the answer is to usually win a best of five, game one draft usually has something left open yes. with yes. an answer that you've prepped. But the prep is not oh, we scrimmed it against a really good team and it worked consistently, it's going to be hopium. Yes. So the hopium <laughs> is going to be super interesting yeah, I, I to check. I don't think any team has had... There is no way it's going to be a sleeper game one drop. No. And it's going to be really fun. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, you got to scrim with them. Was there... I, I interviewed Beryl at that time. He said... I'm going to pick Heimerdinger, and then he pulled out the Heimerdinger. And how they much were playing in scrims. We scrimmed them as well. well. Heimerdinger was making a lot of appearances in scrims. Guys. Okay, that's what I was asking. <laughs> that's what I was asking. Yes. I, I won't ask for anything else so that they can save it for what they pull out yeah. uh, today. Anything else that we have for Jack uh, Monty? Uh, no, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. We're gonna have another guest on here in just a, a few minutes. But I appreciate thanks your so time, much. Jack. No, it's always a pleasure, guys. Thank you. Yeah, Round of applause you, for Jack. Jack. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Owner Cloud9, uh, Jack, Etienne, everyone, one of the class acts in all of esports. Also, say hello again to our friend, the greatest uh, social media and digital person in all of esports. It's Mateus Portillo right there. Look at him. He colored his hair back to normal person, but he's still right there. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mateus. There, there's your shout out, homie.